So uh, we are at pretty much a quorum, I believe. We got about 15 students, which is about everyone I thought we were gonna get, which is awesome. So uh, anybody that won't be coming will be able to tune in on the recording. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew. All right, well, Colin, thanks. And um, yeah, just you know, a, a huge thanks, Colin, for pulling this together in this fashion. Uh, I mean, I know that uh, we all really value the time that we learn and learn together. Uh, so that hasn't changed. I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm still looking very forward to learning alongside each of you. Just, you know, the, for, the format has changed a little. So, um, you know, I want to I wanna first just share that uh, Tree Folks got, uh, we shut our office down on March the 12th. Uh, we were pretty close to the planting season, so we met the majority of our goals with one exception, that is to deliver some uh, community outreach and engagement and educational uh, programming which Colin is now working on. Uh, we're gonna do it virtually instead of, uh, instead of in person. But all of our other deliverables, all of our other goals were met. And in reviewing this, it was just, it was reason to celebrate. So I just, I wanna share some of this with y'all and uh, invite you to kind of celebrate along with us in, uh, in your own way. We, uh, we wrapped up the planting season with our communities plantings. Uh, where we planted over 11,000 trees, 11,560 trees to be exact, uh, in riparian areas all around the city of Austin. Um, so 11,000 trees is pretty significant, that's pretty good. Uh, we also had one of our best neighborhoods tree adoption seasons ever. We adopted out 4,804 trees. Our goal was 4,800, so we topped that by four trees. Uh, I actually have one of those in my yard. So uh, I, I hope that still counts. Otherwise we topped by three trees, but I, it's a tree, it's still a tree. So it counts. Um, so reason to celebrate. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with one of our newer programs, the Remove and Replace program, where we, uh, where we remove dangerous trees from the, uh, from the yards of uh, our low-income neighbors. Uh, it, uh, it helps with affordability, just helps folks stay in their homes. So we actually have funding to pay arborists to remove those dangerous trees, and then we replace them with brand new trees. Uh, so, you know, ensuring the health of our urban tree canopy, we've, uh, we've removed 31 trees at 26 homes. So that's uh, 26 of our, uh, of our families here in Austin that can, uh, that can stay in their homes without the threat of dangerous trees falling on them. Uh, one of our other fairly new programs that's kind of an offshoot of the reforestation we did in Bastrop uh, after the fires and in Blanco after the floods is uh, our reforestation, Travis County uh, floodplain reforestation program, planting trees out uh, all along uh, riparian zones in eastern Travis County uh, and generating carbon credits that we then trade to the city to help meet the zero carbon goal. So, we planted over 50,000 trees on about 87 acres in Eastern Travis County. And you know, that's, that's pretty significant in and of itself, but uh, the, one of the real compelling metrics on that for me is that over the 30 years that we'll be monitoring the growth of those trees, we will sequester more than 11,000 metric tons of CO2. Uh, so, you know, for me, that is, that's, you know, that's worth celebrating. All of these, in fact, are worth celebrating. So I'll, uh, I'll again, you know, invite folks to celebrate along with us. Uh, one, uh, one thing that I didn't mention is our education program. Uh, I did not mention the metrics on it because unlike our other planting programs, uh, it extends a little farther into the year and it keeps on going even after the summit. Uh, so today is another reason to celebrate. Bill. I mean, we're getting together and we're, we're sharing all the work that we're all doing. Uh, and I, uh, I want to just offer a reminder that while we may have other urgent things to, to deal with right now, there may be some other urgent concerns. This work is still so vital and so important that 
we can't lose sight of our mission. Y'all are, uh, y'all are the ones who are keeping this mission going and bringing it out into the community. So I want to thank each of y'all for all of your work uh, for joining today. I want to give a special thanks to Colin for his just creativity, his brilliant mind. I mean, like you can just stand next to the guy, be in the same, you can be on a phone call with the guy and like accidentally learn something, you know? So Colin, uh, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you or anything, man, but, uh, but you've really done some great work. So with that, I am going to offer once again, my thanks to all of you, my thanks to Colin, and I am looking forward to hearing what, uh, what all of y'all have to say. So thanks and good morning. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, just to let you know, my Zoom has kind of crashed. Um, I can see all of you. I can't interact with the program though. So uh, we're, this is probably gonna work still. Uh, I believe Catherine is going to be up next. Uh, Catherine, if you are ready, feel free to unmute yourself and share your okay. screen. All right, can everyone hear me? Can I get a thumbs up? I got you. Yeah, all right. And I'm gonna go share my screen. Post disabled participant screen sharing. Oh. Well, that's not great because I can't touch Zoom. Um, all right, well, I'm probably going to have to close out of this program and get it back up. Hopefully it doesn't kick y'all out of the program. Uh, if it does, please rejoin. Uh, I'll see you in a second. Okay, well, while Colin's doing that, assuming we don't lose the meeting, I'll go ahead and just start talking through um, what I was gonna share and then, um, so, um, so I submitted two CAP projects and what I learned was that uh, the watering plan, they want a three-year watering plan when it comes to tree planting, which makes a lot of sense because what you don't want uh, the city of Austin parks to be full of dead trees and then it's a, you're just creating work for a uh, PARD. So it made a lot of sense, but it's, it's actually pretty challenging. Um, and so I came up with two proposals that are really built around two different watering strategies. So um, the first one is uh, pretty simple, but before I get into all that, let me show you. So if you come through here, there's a little bit of background and resources, but eventually you, you click on this online proposal. And here's the form, you fill out this form and it has a couple uh, th things you need to upload. So you need to upload your, your site map and um, you know, sort of before and after pictures. You need to have your maintenance plan. This is a lot about the watering. Um, and you know, I had a really good uh, experience uh, talking to the team here that runs this program. They have a uh, intern right now and uh, so I had a couple phone calls and a bunch of email exchanges with her and they they were very supportive and my feeling from PARD was they want these projects they they want more of them and so it was an encouraging project so the first uh, one I submitted was a really um, small scale one where my vision for how to water was to use this battery powered transfer pump and that I would buy it myself and, uh, you know, as a donation toward the, the project. And I would go out there myself or lend it to neighbors if I'm out of town to water the trees. And, and based on tree folks guidance, you know, we, you know, it seems like a gold standard to me, but I, I think it would definitely keep the trees alive would be uh, watering 20 weeks uh, a year, all through the summer, once a week, 25 gallons per tree. So it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, this pump apparently will bring water up um, 15 or 18 feet and has really good reviews. So, and it's battery powered, so you can, I can charge it home on my Green Choice Energy program and, you know, wouldn't be burning diesel or gas. So I was excited about that. So the first proposal, there's a beautiful little pond at Northwest Park, if you can see this photo. Um, it's a sweet little pond and it's got these beautiful big cypress trees around it, bald cypress, but in between there's, there's not much. And so, um, and then on this backside is a dam 
Um, and then on the other side of that dam is Shoal Creek. So I wanted to avoid the dam because I understood that that might get reworked at some time. And then there's trails where people walk and they get really close to this edge. And so I didn't, I wanted to avoid that side. So this is actually on the PARD GIS site that, that I got this screenshot and you can put little icons down. So I put little white flags where I wanted to plant eight understory trees. The other thing they asked for is a picture of the before. So here's sort of uh, an example of before, where you can see uh, there's the pond, here's these beautiful cypress trees, but then it's just kind of like mowed right up to the edge there and lawn. So I thought um, there's an attempt to have a no mow zone, but it's, it seems hard to enforce. I thought we'll put some understory trees there. So that was the first project uh, I submitted. Um, then the second one was more involved. Um, the second one, uh, the other watering strategy I had working a lot with Andrew Smiley and Colin Michael was to use a water truck service. Uh, so Tree Folks has um, water truck service capabilities and I, you know, I learned a lot about uh, the capacity of that and the cost for that. And these, these water trucks, you can kind of imagine they would kind of cut the curb and, you know, or, or they can reach about 100 feet, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was 100 meters, but um, so that maybe they can just be on the street and they take two staff members to, you know, they have to go fill up the truck, drive to the place, move the heavy hose around. Um, but they can, they're very reliable and uh, PARD really liked the water truck, you know, like uh, that felt like something that they could count on. So um, what we figured out with Andrew's help was that it was about a 75 uh, tree a day maximum. That once you get past that, you're gonna have to pay for them to come out another day. But 75 trees was, they wouldn't have to refill the water. Uh, they wouldn't have to come back a second day. So that seemed like the optimal, you know, amount of trees to water. So I put together, you know, a, a much more ambitious project for 75 trees and really focused it on near the little internal roads at Northwest Park, kind of avoiding, we do have a lot of beautiful grassy fields that people don't want to have trees on, right? They want to play fetch with their dog or play soccer and stuff like that. So I avoided those areas. And um, I, uh, it's this one. So I put together some documents. So the first one was, um, this is just how I chose to do it, uh, a map, they asked for a map. So starting with like the big picture of Northwest Park, this is the area and then I drilled down further. Okay, now let's talk about this area and then again, use that same flagging um, with the white flags being uh, understory trees and the yellow flags, I'm colorblind, I think they're yellow flags being uh, shade trees. There's actually a, a fair amount of shade trees there. So, um, and I described it as an effort to kind of mimic a forest, so um, concentrated plantings. So I went through different areas of the, the park, you know, in detail showing um, where, where there was an opportunity. I identified 86 sites. Again, we were gonna cap it at 75, so these wouldn't all get planted. Um, and then there's a little like little arroyo kind of here. So that was a really nice riparian opportunity. And the other thing they asked for is an, a before photo. So I just took that same document and went through in the same manner, but now showing the before picture, right? So you can see there's a great tree planting opportunity. You know, a lot of these are just lawn on the edge of a roadside, not a lot going on. Um, so I submitted these and then we'll see whatever happens. Um, well, let me go in a little more detail. So this was gonna cost a, a fair amount of money, these watering truck services um, and all the trees. So we're looking at tens of thousands of dollars. So that's not, that's sort of beyond anything I'm gonna be uh, donating. So there are some resources where you can get funding for your project. Uh, so they have right on that same initial page, they have a, a, a bunch of resources here that could possibly fund it. The two I was looking at are, um, shoot, this is gonna, well, let me just get that out of the way, there we go. The Urban uh, Forest Grant, which can be like literally, I think it was over $100,000 grants that they put out. So 
Um, and I did reach out and just ask like, what is that range? So, you know, I had been thinking of a $35,000, $40,000 project is a lot, but it sounded like that might be on the low side of, of what some of these grants are. That has the application deadline of January 1st and July 1st. Um, I, my understanding was these, and the other one, just to brush ahead, was the, uh, I was looking at this Austin Parks Foundation. They have community grants. They've also done some big projects. Um, and I believe before you really need to get your cap proposal approved and then you move to this step um, is what my understanding was. This one here, unfortunately, is kind of due to COVID is postponed indefinitely. Um, so hopefully that'll come back up. So that's as far as I got on those projects, um, but it was educational and hopefully, you know, I think it's a long game, you know, I'm just not, nothing's going to happen really fast, but I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll eventually proceed. I guess the last thing is I did learn Northwest Park is, has a dual function. So it's really a sculpted park, like a giant retention pond. So there will need to be a lot of modeling around like whether the trees are going to um, interfere with, with flood control function of the park. Uh, but it sounds, you know, that the city is going to devote some resources to look at that and, and determine if that's an issue. And then the other thing is, um, I bet this is true of many parks, they all, you know, there's a plan to make a plan in five years, we're going to revisit our plan and make another plan. And, you know, so uh, I guess we'll wait and see, like, do you have to wait and to get into that planning cycle? Or are they able to sort of allow a project come uh, just in the middle of the the experience. So that wraps it up for my presentation. And oh, good job. Thank you. Yes. Um, All right. so if anybody has any questions for Catherine, uh, you can add them in the chat box just so we're not all talking over each other. Um, and Catherine, you can either read them in the chat box or I will read them to you. All right. I can see the chat box and um, Let's see, what is the cost of the transfer pump? Okay, so Collins answered that. I thought I saw maybe even a little cheaper, okay. I thought maybe under 200. Thanks. Um, thank you for the compliments. Yeah, cap looks good. All right, thank you. Yes, ambitious vision is my specialty. <laughs> All right, well, uh, if we don't have any more questions going coming in the chat, um, let's see, up next, we are going to have Ali Bogham with her Evergreen Native Fact Sheet and Transplant Procedures. So, Ali, if you are ready, I am ready to let you share your screen. Hello. Oh, yeah, give me a second to figure this out. Share screen. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah. great. It just moved you guys far over. All right. Oh, this is not the right, the right one. There we go. So I had a lot of <laughs> ambitions <laughs> and had to kind of filter it out. Uh, so I will show you my draft native uh, evergreen fact sheet at the end, but what I'm mostly going to talk about today is transplanting native seedlings and saplings. Uh, but first, I found Urban Forest Stewards because of um, Stephanie Simmons. We, uh, I'm fortunate to live in a neighborhood that's about to have a, a BCP preserve, and my partner is going to be the steward. And so we embarked on Urban Forest Stewards last year to learn as much as we could about how to maintain that little space there. It's a, it's a 40 acre preserve, so it's not, not so tiny. Uh, and there's tons of ligustermen and I've been complaining to Colin, but we wanted to learn everything we could about trees and ur urban forestry. So here we are. I did not finish the course last year and here I am to, to finish it out. Um, I am fortunate to, to live on one acre in the Edwards Plateau area. So I've got a sloped hillside with all the limestone in the world, thin soil. Uh, not as thin as you would think. I apparently am luckier than, than most. Um, and lots of really cool native plants. So we, we've got a, a full canopy of oak juniper woods. And over the last nine years, we've created path throughout. <clears throat> and in our paths, we have had volunteers of all sorts pop up. So we've got um, some winged and non-winged cedar elms. I was so tickled to find the wings. I think the wings are cool. 
Um, but none of the lacy elms. That's that unfortunately we have not had. Uh, some escarpment black cherry, um, Texas persimmon, Texas redbud, gumbamelia, evergreen sumac, Carolina buckthorn, agarita, you name it. We we mostly have it. There's, there's, we got a lot of things, uh, but those paths we need them to to keep being walkable. So I've been working on transplanting those uh, volunteers and getting them to different sites or to people that maybe need those plants. All right. So I've learned over the years the right tool matters. Uh, I never wanted to buy anything. My partner's always the one that's like, we can get a better tool for this. I'm like, no, we don't need to spend the money. <laughs> But the right tool matters. Um, <clears throat> we went from taking dead trees down with like axes and, and kukris to finding the right tools. So I think we've got every tool under the sun and all the coolest name tools. Uh, but my favorite uh, is the Hori Hori. It's a Japanese tool pictured there. It's got a, a serrated saw-like edge on one side and a smooth, sharp edge on the other. I have cut myself. It is a dangerous tool. Be smart. Uh, but I use that thing for everything, and that is probably my favorite transplanting tool. Uh, also for this project, uh, a mini pick was really useful uh, to help loosen up all the dirt around, uh, around the roots and pry up limestone rocks that are in your way when you're trying to transplant. And then the root slayer. Um, hands in the air if you guys know the root slayer. Yeah, 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 root slayers are the bomb if you're trying to get rid of something. <laughs> so we came across the root slayer because um, like most landscaped yards, we had like 30 hedged shrubs in our yard. I, I hated our front yard. It was just balls of crappy plants. <clears throat> uh, so we root slayed all those out and the root slayer was easily the, the fastest way to get rid of something we didn't want. Uh, but as far as transplanting goes, the root slayer has been phenomenal for <clears throat> uh, around a, a wide range of the, of the root area to be able to sever the roots when I'm trying to work on transplanting. All right, so I transplant, I've transplanted a lot, and you guys correct me on the terminology, you tree folks experts, um, but I'm considering anything that's a pencil size, let me see, I probably got one, okay, so pencil sized or skinnier, I'm calling it a seedling, so, so small, small things, uh, and anything bigger than that, I'm, I'm going to consider it a sapling, and so size matters here with how I'm going to move and, and transplant different things, and I'm just going to share with you what I've done, and I'd love to know y'all's experiences when I'm all done. Uh, so with, with little seedlings, um, well, I'll show off in a minute. I've got a few plants to show. Uh, I mostly use the Hori Hori. Uh, I get just a few inches away from, from the stalk and shove that Hori Hori deep down, pop it up, and for the most part, I'm able to get like the whole root system. When I don't, I'm a little nervous, but I'll just dip that in uh, some rooting hormone, pot it up, water it, and baby it. Um, saplings, a little more complicated with the saplings, I need to think more about it, and I'll start out by severing the root system with that root slayer um, as wide as, as I can. I think I, I get a little overzealous and I try to go as wide as possible because I want the plant to survive. So I think I make a little bit more work for myself by trying to get too, too much of the root system, but it works out. Um, and after severing the outside of the, the root zone, I'll let it sit for a while and let the, the tree recover. Um, and I did this a little differently with different uh, saplings. Um, when I severed the root zone, some of them, I just left the whole tree. And on some of them, I would go ahead and, and top it to what I, would, what I was thinking I was doing is if I lost the, the roots, it can't get everything all the way to the top to feed the, the tree. And so I, I thought I was helping it recover. Um, both ways seem to do all right, <laughs> so, so we'll see. And after, after a, a couple of months, um, sometimes I did something as quick as like three weeks after, the, of, after severing the roots, I'd go back and start working with that pick and the hori hori to loosen up the roots in the soil and get all the limestone rocks out and get that sapling out and pot it up, water it, and baby it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the top, the top of these little bar graphs, that's 100%. Uh, I've been trying to track how successful this has been going, and I'm only showing you four tree, well, native plant species, because those are the most of what I've transplanted. Uh, if it's not listed here, I've only transplanted one or two of them. Um, I've had 100% success with escarpment black cherries and with agarita. 
Um, I've only lost a few Texas red buds and I have had the most failure with Texas persimmon. Uh, and speaking with Colin about this, he, he warned me that I would not have success with persimmon. I thought, well, okay, let's just see. And all in all, I've had one survive. Um, so you're very right, Colin. Um, <clears throat> You know, when I, when I started to do this, I, I hypothesized that it was going to be the seedlings, the really little guys that were going to have the greatest success rate. But in the end, it was pretty equal. Um, I think the bigger difference is how much work it, it takes to transplant a larger sapling as opposed to a smaller seedling. Um, but we'll see more data. We'll give more information. So I just, I just love my woods and I love nature and all the critters that are out there. Um, it's been really cool to be able to pop these things out that are still great things and use them elsewhere and have them be able to survive. Uh, again, I'm on a, a slope and we've got some erosion issues. So I've been popping these guys in to manage erosion issues um, and then uh, gifting things that, that we have access of. So if anyone wants a gumbamilia, I've got about a, a three foot tall gumbamilia that you can have. And if you want a Texas red bud, I've got like a, I don't know, like a two and a half foot tall Texas red bud that, that you guys can have. And then if you're interested, this is, this is my only surviving persimmon. And you can see it's like two inches tall, very, very small, but he's alive. And um, I didn't know how special Carolina buckthorn was because it just, it just is here, but um, Colleen Dieter has supported us in our landscaping and she let us know that um, the deer love to eat it and we don't have deer, so we've got it everywhere. I've been finding babies and I've been popping it out. So here is a little baby, Carolina Buckthorn, I guess, I don't know, like he's like eight inches tall maybe, maybe six, eight inches tall. Um, and all these little guys have done really well. They're super happy. And then <clears throat> here's a, an Agarita. We've got, I don't know, like a foot and a half tall agarita. Now he, he poked the heck out of me, but I got him out and he succeeded. And I, I won't lie, he, I didn't think this one was going to make it. He had quite a few browning leaves for a while, but, you know, he made it. So here we are. <laughs> and then Colin has my pride and joy. I had, um, there was a very large black cherry that was in a path that it just could not it just could not be there. And I didn't want to kill it, so I was scared to transplant it at a, a smaller size <laughs> and waited too long. I transplanted it when it was uh, taller than me, I'm 5'4", uh, and Colin has it and it's alive. <laughs> so, woo woo! <laughs> and uh, on the screen here, this is, I don't even remember where I came across this quote, but I, I just love it. And it's, it's in the end, uh, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand and that we will only understand what we are taught. And I don't know how to say his name, but it's a forest engineer in Senegal that, that spoke those words. And I, I think no truer words could have been spoken. And I think that concludes it. I, okay, so I, I did uh, embark on this journey wanting to make Ligustrum illegal to sell in Texas, and that is far greater of a task than I could have imagined. Uh, the nursery industry makes so much money on it. Uh, I'm still interested in tackling that, but I am in the very beginning stages, like just reaching out to local groups and finding out data, like how many volunteer hours are spent on getting rid of this, how much money do you sink in getting rid of this, and building a, a data set to move forward, because there is a nice little form I found on the uh, Texas Department of Agri Agriculture to um, initiate such action, not, not that I expect anything to happen. Uh, and then I a more reasonable endeavor working on this legustrum issue is to create an evergreen fact sheet that maybe I can share with neighbors, with nurseries, landscapers, and particularly places where I see legustrum. Uh, and I have, I have embarked on that, so let me see if I can show you. Okay, so I'm, I, there's only a draft, uh, but here's my draft. So I've, I've included a cherry laurel, an aqua, evergreen sumac, Mexican silk tassel, Yopan, and I'm not sure I want to keep Texas sage on there just because it doesn't, I don't know, I feel like even though it's an evergreen, it's not quite the same style as the rest, but still an evergreen. Um, and I wanted to fill in the special features. You know, people always talk about, oh, but the blossoms on the legustrum, the bees just love it. Well, they'll love anything else too. So I'd love to highlight 
the fragrant flowers, the beautiful berries, you know, all these things. So people maybe will, will make a, a better choice for nature in their landscapes. Um, I, if you I guys have- I you off, but uh, there are some questions in the chat. I want you to get those before you run out of time. So- Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. I don't even know how to find it. Uh, down on the bottom, there should be a little button that says chat. If you click that. Is it the, no. Sorry. It helps stop sharing my screen. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, you good. Let's try this. I don't even know. It's okay. Stop. There it is. Stop sharing. Thank there you. we go. I'm sorry. There. Um, gosh, I don't know where to start. Allie. Uh, okay, Root Slayer different from Sharpshooter. I have never heard of a Sharpshooter. Colin, can you help me or Andrew? Uh, sharpshooters are what we use for sapling days. It's like a very oh, narrow shovel. It, it is. It is very different. Yes, those are very different. I've used a Sharpshooter once. I, did, I don't like those things. I'm sure there's a better way to use it. Uh, yeah, it's very different. Uh, I should have brought my Root Slayer in. It is it's literally a bladed shovel and I'm ignorant of the proper shoveling tool. So I know there's like a spade shape and then there's like the long one. So it's the long one, whatever that's, what's the proper word for that? The long one, the long shovel. If that is the, that's the sharpshooter. Oh, okay. Well, it's a bladed sharpshooter. So the bottom of the, like the, the part that you first shove into the ground is curved. It's curved up. So it would go around a root and it's bladed, so it'll just cut right through that thing. And then the sides along there is, it's like a saw. So if you can't just shove that blade and cut something, you can saw it. <laughs> um, now we have busted through irrigation pipes with that, so call and know before you dig. Okay, um, do you plan to engage any neighborhood groups? Oh wait, is that the big event? That's not me, is it? the tree oh, I've got I've got demonstrations <laughs> all right regular old sharpshooter no blade see do you, can you see these nice blades there and then the bottom is all sharp yeah Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the assist um what else do we want to ask what's the criteria for choosing to cut the sapling back oh gosh I don't really have a criteria so What's the criteria? A, a sapling that was small-ish, so like, I don't know, like one and a half to, to three foot tall, I did kind of leave those. If, if it approached like, it was height for me, if it approached a taller height, four feet and taller, I felt the need to take it back by um, a, a third to a half. And that tree that I gave Colin that was about like five, four in height, I took that back at least a third. I don't know how tall it is now. So I can actually answer this one a little bit better. Uh, if y'all want protocols for digging stuff up like this, there are uh, bonsai techniques. People have been doing this for century. It's called Yamadori. Um, basically, if you remove more than like 50% of the root mass, you need to start removing some of the canopy as well because they need to balance. Um, and there's also a question here about leaving the sapling in place after you do the root slayer. Uh, you can do that. That is what some bonsai people do because it makes the tree grow a more compact root mass. Uh, it makes it easier to transplant. Uh, you can also just dig it up and transplant it then. There's alternate schools of thought there. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, I believe up next, we are going to have Adam and Bill Longley. Uh, They're going to present together on their project, planting a pro uh, they're doing a planting project at a local golf course, right? Yeah. Hey, right. hey, hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Adam, mic check for you. Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Okay, cool. cool. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Oops. There we go. Okay. Let's see. Can y'all see that? Okay, good. Okay, so um, so we sort of settled on our project with regard to Riverside Golf Course here in Austin after talking uh, big picture about golf courses and trees, and we 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 reached our 
uh, project topic after uh, playing <laughs> playing a lot of golf over the years <laughs> and also you know through our interest in trees through this course, um, we thought that there may be some room for, um, for a project here. Uh, typically with golfers and tree and, um, you know, folks that, that are really interested in trees, there may not be a whole lot of overlap between those two categories. Uh, in fact, in most of the literature we read um, put out by the, the PGA, the Professional Golf Association, uh, most of that was about cutting back trees uh, getting rid of them or minimizing trees impact on the course uh, because of, you know, interference with uh, shot, you know, people taking shots at, on golf courses and trees being in the way. I mean, the, for, I think everyone's familiar with the game of golf, but the point is to get a tiny ball in a tiny hole hundreds of yards away. And the more trees that are, that are in the way between you and the hole, the harder it is to do. And so, I think trees have kind of gotten a bad rap on golf courses over the years. Um, and, and so uh, that's probably why a lot of the literature that's put out by course designers and, and golf enthusiasts uh, is in a way sort of anti-tree. Um, but we do think that there, there may be some room for, uh, for more trees on golf courses, specifically with regard to public publicly owned golf courses. Private courses are, you know, there, there may not be a whole lot that can be done there unless you had someone running the course or a designer that was, uh, you know, really into trees. But I think public, publicly owned courses um, might be an option, especially in a city like Austin where you have um, maybe a more um, progressive uh, city council for municipal courses that uh, would push for uh, having more trees on on golf courses as uh, just the right thing to do uh, from an environmental standpoint. So I'll go. Let's see. Here is here's a Google Earth look at the Riverside neighborhood, and um, you may need to move your your zoom window a little bit to see the golf course, which is on the right hand side, there's, there's kind of one swath of green area on this whole, uh, this whole look at, at this area of Austin. And that's uh, a city park and some softball fields. And then Riverside golf course is, is right there as well. So this is prime real estate in the middle of an urban setting. Uh, the, a developing urban setting, especially around Riverside, but I think you'll find the same view as uh, a similar view of other municipal golf courses in town, whether it be Morris Williams Golf Course on the east side, which is a city-owned course, or Lion, Lions Municipal Course on the west side of town, um, all sort of look similar to this. And so we think that that to be able to provide more trees on these golf courses would have positive impacts, of course, to the people that are playing golf, uh, you know, 